Hi, I'm Tech Dave, and today we're looking at something I actually found by a bin, which was horrifying and glorious at the same time. It's um, it's an IBM model ThinkPad, uh, made made by Lenovo, I believe, but it's still got the IBM logo, and it's it's the T42. And I'm going to take you on a bit of a journey through how I took this from being a piece of trash to a retro games setup, basically. Um, it's, it, I found it pretty much in the condition it's in now, and if anyone wants to see a future video where I refurb it and get the dock and the new battery and all this kind of stuff, which I intend to do, uh, let me know in the comments. But yeah, T42, it's, it came with 2 gigs of RAM, DDR1 I believe, like or just DDR RAM, uh, 5x4 aspect ratio screen, which is great, it's only 10, 24 by 768 um, and it's got, if you can bring the camera in closer, it's got this bizarre stickers on the keyboard and I don't know what language it is, I haven't been able to like find anything that looks similar but the laptop was made in Australia and distributed from Canada but I think the owner of it, I thought it might be like Arabic or some sort of, or like, uh, like more older Style. Like, I can't think what word I'm looking for, but yeah, I thought it might be some unusual symbol system from a language that I don't recognise, obviously. But I actually noticed, my partner, point, partner pointed out to me, that they're actually individual stickers for each key. So it's still a full English QWERTY keyboard, but it's got stickers on every single key that show, that show various symbols, so I don't know what that is. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to kind of get on to what I did. Uh, in the next section of the video, but and we'll go through the I/O and the ports and sort of what it is. But it's um, yeah, two gigs of RAM, two one gig sticks of DDR RAM. It's got a one point seven gigahertz Pentium M single core, I believe, and it was it came with Windows XP on it on this IDE hard drive, 40 gig ID hard drive, which I should be using to replicate the process I went through. But essentially, I put an MSATA SSD in an ID converter so that I could use this as basically SATA 2 speeds or SATA 1 speeds, but really fast. The only the only real fault with it is obviously the battery is a bit dead. Uh, it still charges and holds charge, but only for about 20 minutes. And the DVD drive, which is removable, so I intend to replace it in the next video, uh, spins up, but then doesn't. It doesn't actually recognise the drive, and you can't boot off it. So that's the only real issues with it, other than slightly cosmetic stuff. So I'll be back after rolling the titles with the uh, breakdown and what I did to get this working. <laughs> I'm briefly just going to take you through the I.O. Starting with the front, so we've got the IBM ThinkPad logo on top here. Let me get out my own light here. And then there's just this one catch here. There's like a textured surface here. And then on the left-hand side, we've got the, PM, the dual PMCIA card slots, I believe they are. And then there's the CPU fan exhaust, microphone headphone jack, Ethernet, which is 10 100 and uh, RJ11, I think it is, or RJ45, the, the telephone jack, S-Video, two USB ports. And around the back, we've got a parallel port, which is enormously exciting, because I was thinking of getting the OPL2 external uh, sound card for it. There's the power jack, single six-cell battery, and there's, there's, there's little bits of cosmetic damage, but it's... It's not actually in bad condition. There's a few little nicks, whatever. And then on this side, we've got the VGA port and the non-working drive. But the cool thing about this is that it is hot swappable. So I've discovered you can get PATA or ATA. Basically, you can get a, you can put a hard drive caddy in there with a standard hard drive or SATA SSD. So I'm thinking of doing that and then having dual hard drives in it, or maybe just booting off this one here. But apparently, uh, based on a video I was watching before, you have to have the main drive 
very populated, even if you don't actually use it. So I've got a 64 gig SSD, M SATA SSD that I might put in there on a more long-term basis, just as a blank so that it boots. And on the subject of the M SATA SSD, that is situated behind this little door here. I'm not getting very good light. There we go. This little door here is just one screw and you kind of, you have to have the lid open to get it, but I'll show you that in a minute. Um, and the condition of the laptop, so it's basically got rusty screws, which made me think it's absolutely destroyed, but on everything on the inside is absolutely fine. And everything just works perfectly. Even the fans aren't particularly dirty. And I, I did sort of rip it apart and have a little look. I'm not going to do that on the video. But it runs pretty well. And I don't know whether you can see that. I'll try and avoid displaying my Windows XP license just in case. Um, where does it say? Australia. So that's what I only think it's something to do with Australia. Uh, but I don't, and then Canada as well for the FCC license. But that, that's sort of where I got that probably wrong information from. But yeah, I'll be back in a second with a breakdown and I'll show you how to change the hard drive. Um, cause I need to put this in anyway, but we'll be back briefly in just one second with what I've done with the computer and then we'll go through how we went about that. And just while I'm showing you the hardware, we have the access IBM button for BIOS, the three buttons. We've got the power button there. We've got all the think lights. It's still got a sticker on. So when I refurbish it, I'm going to lovingly and thoroughly enjoy pulling that off. It's got kind of um, X230 style, sorry, not X230, uh, X220 style keyboard. But obviously these top buttons are all in gray and you've got the functions button. It does actually have the think light as well, which is function and page up together, which is quite cool. And it's, it's got these bizarre stickers on it. I don't know what language that is. If anyone knows, please let me know because I'm genuinely interested. And I might even install that keyboard board to my operating system for the lols. So yeah, where did we get to? Basically, I've triple booted it and this was a arduous, painful, long-winded process and I've got some friends to thank at the end of the video on Twitter, especially uh, one particular person. That basically, my Twitter friends advise me on things because I, I'm... I can lag my way through, but I'm with Windows 98, which is the first operating system. This is just like a little boot screen. In fact, actually, you can't really see that. Let's get that a bit more lined up. This is a little boot screen that came with EasyBCD, which I used to sort of organize the, um, organize the install. But as you can see, I've got Windows 7. This is just like a thing I can't seem to get rid of, but I've got Windows 7, 32-bit ultimate, fully activated, Windows XP with a license key from the bottom of the laptop, and uh, Windows 98, which I got from WinWorld, the ISO and stuff. Obviously, I've got a product key for it, but... Um, yeah, so I'm going to just boot into Windows 98. And I and to, uh, actually, I got Windows 98 Unofficial Service Pack 3 on here. And I've only really installed the basic drivers for Windows 98 because it's basically a nightmare for me to figure out. As you can see, we've got this lovely um, IBM ThinkPad background. Uh, it should be the correct model. It's the right resolution as well. Um, so I installed... Uh, unofficial service pack three. As you can see, we've got one gig of RAM. I don't know whether you can see that. I should be able to see that. One gig of RAM recognized because of the service pack three, but it's actually got two gigs of RAM in it. And that was, that was like, took a long time to figure out. So we've got display adapter working, Radeon 7500 series. Um, everything else here works except for obviously the CD drive. And we've this another one that took me absolutely forever was to get these sound drive the sound max integrated digital audio. And you probably hear me pulling my hair out in the background when I'm showing you how to do that again because I don't exactly remember how I did it. Um so that's the first operating system. And then uh but god damn, I'll tell you what, when I heard that first boot chime The first time I, I finally got the sound drivers working on Windows 98, I was like in heaven. It was amazing. I don't know if you can hear, I'm a little bit ill, so I apologise if my voice is extra nasally. I do have a 
rather large nose as it is, as I'm sure you've seen in my videos. So when I get sick, it kind of amplifies my nasaliness, which is quite amusing. Windows XP was relatively straightforward. I used a program called Easy to Boot, which I will show you uh, later on in the video how to do that. It's basically a USB booter because the DVD drive doesn't work. I had to boot Windows 98 and uh, Windows XP uh, yeah, uh, from a USB stick. Um, and that was actually really straightforward because I watched a couple of it, two different videos from a guy called Phil at Phil's Computer Lab. He's an absolute legend for, especially for Windows 98. Like I've used loads of his resources to try and get this stuff done. But as you can see here, we've got, oh, sorry, wrong one. We've got my computer. We've got, so we've got the two full two gigs of RAM visible here now in Windows XP. I don't know whether you can see that on screen, but I can see that. I hope you can see that. Uh, Pentium M 1.7 gigahertz service pack three, but that again is actually an unofficial service pack four, which is all the updates up to end of service for Windows XP, which again, I'll show you how to get. Device manager. This is enormously satisfying for me, but it's fully populated through another thing I got from Phil's computer lab, which is the snappy driver installer, which I should show you how to use. I say my antivirus is turned off, but it turns off every time. Um, I don't quite understand why that is. Oh, why is my firewall off as well? That's not good. Turn on firewall. Enable now. Um, yeah, and I may even at the end of the video as a little bonus show you how to get your um, Windows... Sorry, your Steam games on Windows XP because that's something I intend to do later on. Um, the other thing that's worth showing you while we're here is actually the drive structure. So, I don't know whether you can see that easily, but I, I basically, again, I'll show you how to do this. I, mean, I installed Windows 98 formatted with FDisk, a 20 gig partition. Then I installed Windows XP as a, an NTFS partition, Windows 7 and NTF, NTFS partition, and then I made a shared folder in FAT32 of another 20 gig. So, that, so I've basically got two 20 gig FAT32 partitions and two roughly 100 gig, well, 80 gig for Windows XP and 100 gig for Windows 7 partitions, which seemed appropriate. And again, I'll show you how to do that. I actually used Linux Mint Cinnamon uh, 13, I believe it was, 32-bit um, edition, because it was the only one I could find, oh, yeah, the only one I could find that didn't have... PAE restrictions, which I don't entirely remember what that means off the top of my head, but it's something to do with the CPU um, that made it impossible to boot like a normal Linux USB. But we'll get around to that. So I'm just going to show you what we've done with Windows 7 briefly because I've come this far, I might as well. This might take some time. I basically got identical. I just want to show you I've got all the drivers and then we'll go through how we did it. I got this boot menu from this one here, but I also got, I set up this boot menu in Easy BCD. So there's going to be a list of all the software required. The only thing I'm not going to tell you how to do is get the ISOs and product keys, because obviously that would be not necessarily immoral, but illegal. Um, but I'm sure with a bit of Google Foo, you'd be able to figure that one out pretty, pretty easy. Um, this is a com except for Windows 7, this is a completely offline machine. And that's why I made this, this shared folder with this spare 20 gig partition. Because then I can go on and use the internet on Windows 7. Which is now technically insecure as well, but it's made more secure. So I'm going to... Yeah, it's way more secure than XP and Windows 98, I can assure you of that. Um, and again, I need my computer going to just show you all the drivers installed and then we're going to go through how we did that let's cover that up quickly and go to device manager so as you can see we've got a fully populated list of non errors this one getting the right driver from snappy driver took a few attempts but there's only there's three drivers on there basically 
uh, one driver, the second driver works for XP and the first driver works for Windows 7. So that's basically what we're aiming to do here today. If you've seen enough, then uh, au revoir. But um, if you want to know how I went about this and what comes prior to all of this happening, yeah, I don't want to wait around for that, then stay with the video and then you'll find out how we do this because it's actually quite an arduous process that took quite a lot of thought and a lot of help from my friends on Twitter uh, but I did manage to do this it took me it took me around three days after getting the charger let me just turn around so you can see my pretty face it took me about three days of work to get to the point where I could get all the resources I need found uh, including Service Pack 3 and Service Pack 4 for 98 and XP respectively. And it was just a lot of faff, so I hope that if you do stick around, this is useful to you in some way. So, I'll be back. So, sorry if the audio quality is not great, filming the audio off my webcam. So, here we are on the browser looking at the software requirements. So, we've got Linux Mint Maya 13 cinnamon so that's just at Linux Mint and then you go to version so all versions and you if basically if you just google Linux Mint 13 it'll be the first hit and then you want 32 bit and then you want to go down to whatever your nearest mirror is and download that I you chose the UK like in Bitemark hosting it seems to be quite fast and reliable and then download uh, next, you need to go to rufus.ie, and this is to burn the Linux Mint distribution. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so we want Rufus version 3.8. Then the next thing, I believe this is freeware. If not, I will have to remove this part of the video, but I, I gather it's possible to uh, distribute this as evidently because they are. Um, it's winworldpc.com forward slash product forward slash windows 98 or windows hyphen 98 and then 98 hyphen second hyphen edition and now I'm not going to show you how to get the product key but if you in fact there it is right so well that's the end of that um, and then we've got over here so again I just googled unofficial service pack 3 for windows 98 uh, it's it's htasoft.com and then there's obviously you can see that there uh, Windows 98 or WS 98 SE underscore post underscore USP 4 dot PHP and it's just basically all the patches and hotfixes you can you can read the website and go through it but that's that's what I use to get the service pack uh, unofficial service pack 4 for Windows XP again I just googled it and there's instructions on this website how to acquire it, but it's all all the um, what am I trying to say? It's all the different versions of Windows XP uh, updates that ran right the way up to 2014. And then for Windows 7, I went to I downloaded ImageBurn or IMGBurn. Dot, so just IMGBurn.com, and then you go to the Downloads folder, and then go Mirror 7 is what you want, and get. Um, for what because you're gonna need a separate computer to do this, so you're gonna need that. And then the last website is easy to boot, so the number two boot.com. Um and you wanna get if you scroll down there will be where is it? A little bit further up. Where is it? Download easy to boot. There we go, and then you want to scroll down and basically you want the one that's DPMS there we go so you click download button and then you go to E2B downloads are here and you want this version here which is the one with SATA drivers for Windows XP just in case because if you're using a different drive in the say the um, what's the word I'm looking for in the the drive bay instead of um, the built-in drive this would be really handy and uh, basically all it is, is it includes SATA RAID and SCSI drivers for Windows XP so you might as well have that version it's only 11 megabytes bigger um, 
and it's extremely useful so we'll come to how to use all of that but I just thought I'd cover the software requirements before we go any further. So the other thing I need to mention is if you go to vogons.org view topic dot php question mark t equals four seven five nine one there's some of the instructions and a download on Mediafire for all the drivers that are used to install Windows ninety eight. Um with all the drivers for Windows ninety eight basically. And that's where I got it from. And it's really handy, it comes with this little um this is this is a text file that's included with the package that tells you how to install everything. I'll show you which ones to use when we're there because there's certain ones that don't quite work. But you just right click this media file link, download, etc. etc. And then jobs are good. <coughs> and then also there's another set here at sdfox7.com forward slash IBM forward slash lowercase t forty forward slash t forty underscore ninety eight and these all seem to be very useful as well um, so it's up to you which set you use but I kind of intermingled the both of them so it's worth getting so but this website is the most useful one this website is the most useful one the other thing I didn't mention in the other part the previous part of the video was that the reason I got image burn from Windows 7 is because I've got a Windows 7 32 bit uh, ultimate um, disk file a uh, disk you need to extract the ISO using that, so I'll show you how to do that. But first, we need to show you how to get the actual hardware itself. So on eBay, that's probably racist doing a French accent like that, but I don't we don't intend it to be. On eBay, there's one here for sixty, well, fifty-nine pounds plus eleven pounds postage, so seventy in total. It's the same version I've got. Looks to be in really good condition. Uh, so that's kind of a benchmark for the price. They go up, well there's one here for £100, £145 but with a 1.8 GHz CPU. I know you can actually upgrade the CPU which I am considering. And then there's another one here for £30 plus £20 postage. I actually saw, when I first looked these up I saw one for like £10. Um, they just didn't have a hard drive. In fact there it is, there's one for £17 pounds and 14 pence I think it was that one it was from Italy that one um, and I think sold not as was not working so missing all these things but you might get lucky um, and sort of hobble one together for about 15 20 pounds but anyway the other thing you might need is first off an M, M SATA to IDE adapter this here's six pounds 74 on eBay so if you just google that I got the one with the case, I've got literally this exact one as you'll see later on in the video, um, so that I didn't have to wedge it into the the drive bay like spuriously, it just fits perfectly. And I also got, I got a Sunbow one which is cheaper than this, but I got the MSATA SSD that I used in a previous video, when was that? Uh, anyway, the, the desktop replacement. But you can see they go up to quite a lot of money for 240 gig. But I think I got mine for 30 pounds. I mean, there's these brand, for it, these cheap brand ones, uh, like here, this one. It might be suitable. I mean, it depends what I'm, how many operating systems you're putting on there. But um, I would say 240 gigs is good. Very, and if you're copying what I'm doing, it's a good amount to have. But tracking down a cheap MSATA SSD is kind of something you're gonna have to just scope out, these guys look super cheap and I had what did I have, I had the Sunbow one so I might see if I can find, I think I've got mine on eBay as well um, no, no, no. there we go, so £23 but that's like a lower capacity, let's see um, so they're only 32 gig. but you get the idea, you're looking about 30 40 quid for it to work, I'll be right on back and for the final bit of software required, now this won't work for Windows 2000, but it's a godsend for Windows 7 and XP. You go to sditool.org, go to download, and then I got the full torrent and put it on a 32 gig USB stick. So as you can see, it's just under 17 gigabytes. And again, God bless.
girl's computer lab for this. Um, and it, it, I've got 200 megabit per second download speed, so it didn't take me that long to get it. But I would recommend getting the torrent because this other version uh, only downloads what you need, but you need to be able to access the internet on the computer you're using. So that can be a bit sketchy with Windows XP. So yeah, I'd recommend downloading the torrent version. I think I think that's all the software you might need. If I think of anything else, I will uh, return. So what you want to do when you've uh, formed, got all the software that I have instructed you to acquire for the processors of this, is get at least a uh, 16, if not 32 gig drive and deposit all of it on here. All of it, except for image burn, which we'll use later on on like a modern PC to extract our Windows 7 ISO, but everything else goes on here and it needs to be formatted to FAT32. So basically you put the drive in, right click on it in Windows Explorer, format and then choose FAT32, sorted. So now we've got all our software prepared on a USB stick. We may, actually that's a good point, you'll need a second USB stick for your installs. So put all the software on there and then I'll show you in another section of the video. Uh, so ideally you want two USB sticks or a dedicated drive. But for now we're just going to show you how to install the MSATA SSD. So, take the device, close it up, unplug. Remove the battery, so you pull that little tab there. Then we get a Phillips head screwdriver and turn this screw down here. Let's see if you can see that properly. Turn this screw down here, remove it, undo the catch on the lid, and with a little bit of gentle force, it should pry out. There we go. And as you can see, what I've got here is the drive caddy that the hard drive comes into, comes in, sorry. And then the the external door is kind of hinged over the screws. So we do actually need that. But just for the sake of speed, in fact, no, yeah. I'll do this off camera, then I'll be back. But basically, once you've got your ID, hard drive, uh, SSD, MSATA SSD connected internally in, the, in the, the adapter, which is really straightforward, basically you just put the drive in. I may show you that off in, in a minute or in some B-roll. But you're basically just switching out this drive with this drive, but the other way around, because you'll probably have a hard drive in yours. So I'll be back once I've quickly just screwed all the screws off on this. Just for the sake of efficiency of speed, because I've done this probably too many times now, I'm just going to add two screws. It should be fine without the caddy on it. So I'm going to add them at the rear of the drive. And you can see that. It's quite hard to see the camera because of the angle it's at. Another one on the other side. At the, at the rear side of the drive without the IDE ports. And then, this goes on with the tab facing upwards, I believe. And then that hooks on nicely. And then you've basically got your contraption. Obviously, if you're following exactly what I'm doing, Yours will be the MSATA SSD and the IDE adapter. But then we just reinsert that in here. And it should sit nice and flush, connecting with the IDE pins. And then, where's my screw gone? Where's that screw? There's that screw. And then you just reinsert this screw. And Bob's your uncle. You've got your new hard drive installed. As you can see, I've just reinserted the battery and then we're going to add our power lead, which I had to buy separately, which is cool, but I had to buy it separately. And then um, if you've got a blank drive, you need to plug in the USB straight away. So I kind of fluffed over what I was saying before. So this needs all the files and Snappy Driver installed the files on it and everything that I said about, whereas you need another USB stick, sorry, which I did forgot to mention that has that can be used for the easy to boot process so i'm going to show you that in fact i'll link i'll link the two videos from phil's computer lab so look in the description down below here um because it's incredibly complicated 
but also quite simple. So, but he just explains it so well. There's no point in me going through it and actually making you watch me bumble through it and explain it when he's already done it like perfectly. So, I'll be back with a better camera angle to show you what happens when we get to easy to boot. So here we are on our T42. Boot the power button, and then when the splash screen comes up, press that. Then you want to go, this is the access IBM button, you want to press F1. Then you want to go down to startup, boot, and ensure that somewhere in here on this list is the word USB hard drive. Um, because, oh, my top lighting just went off, of course. But anyway, you need, you, need, you need that on there, and then you just press F10. Save configuration and exit. Plug in your USB stick. <coughs> that you made from easy to boot. And I think I've still got this. Oh no, this is Windows 7. Right, I'll be back in a second. So, assuming... So basically, I just, I just went back. Because uh, I uh, used... The, I still had, from the previous install, Windows 7 on my disk. And so you should have... At the end of watching Phil's computer lab video on Windows 98, in this folder here, you should have something called, you should have, sorry, let me go through that again. In the E2B ISO win folder, you put your Windows 98 fold file. And the only way, the only reason that my video differs from Phil's is that I'm just putting both the ISOs on the USB simultaneously and then I refer you back to his video but I'm going to show you the install process a little bit as well anyway but yeah so once that's copied then you also want to copy your um, Windows XP from where you've got it stored into the folder E2B IS, oh, not that one. ISO, and then Windows, then XP, put that in there, and then you've got both operating systems bootable from the easy to boot USB stick. So, just in case you haven't yet got around to watching that, um, Phil makes a uh, condensed ISO using something called Ultra ISO. And I recommend if you actually do want to do this for Windows 98, watch that. Um, and he go he talks through everything that I'm about to do um, in like a lot of detail and just phrases it really well. So I, if it's just all right with you, I'd prefer you to watch it on there. So I'm just copying this file and then we'll go back to booting on the machine and I'll show you what I did for my circumstances that made it a bit more unique. Now, one last requirement before we install Windows 98, which I actually forgot about, because I'm a bit disorganised today. I've done. I've been working on this project for four days, just trying to get the basic idea together. So I'm a bit strung out. So we need to go to. If you've got the same amount of RAM as me, which is two gigs, so one in the underneath the keyboard, and then one just here, which I should move over. You need to remove for the Windows 98 basic install one of those. RAM drives, and the easiest one obviously is the one on the back, RAM modules, so it's just under this little thing here, I hope you can see alright, and you lift it up, pop out one of those RAM modules, because Windows 98 standard, well normal Windows 98 can't boot with more than 512 gigs, and Windows 98 second edition can't boot with more than 1 gig, so we should be groovy, now to boot windows with just one gig of ram i don't think dos will have any issues with it although potentially but i certainly didn't experience that before because you boot it through the windows 98 cd so I'll be back with the install process in fact actually should i just move the camera so I'll put the usb stick in that we've prepared following when the uh, phil's computer labs video that i linked in the description and we're basically following exactly what he did, but we're gonna make 
very small partition for Windows 98. I'm just gonna do, I'm just gonna split it evenly, 10 gig, 10 gig, 10 gig, 10 gig, for each thing. So, first 10 gig is for Windows 98. 10 gig for Windows XP, which may not be enough, so I may have to expand that. I'm not really sure. Maybe I might make it 15, 15, but we'll see how it goes. So this takes a while, so I'll be back when we're actually in. It just this is a boot process. All right, so after some Google Foo, I realized that I need a significantly smaller amount for Windows 98 than I actually initially envisioned. I'm not going to have that many games on it, and I'm going to have an additional partition for shared files between all the operating systems, so I might dedicate that to it. But basically what we've done here, we've booted um, our easy-to-boot USB. You want to go down to option 4, which is the fifth one down. And we're basically following Phil's Computer Labs tutorial at this stage should prompt you to ask which ISO you want to use. If you get stuck here, just remove the Windows XP ISO for now. And again, this will take a minute. So I'll be back so as to save time in the video. So I made a little mistake there. Sorry, it was actually option three, Windows boot menu just here. Excuse me. So I'm hoping and assuming that you're watching Phil's computer lab thing to do this, but all I'm showing you here is the difference in what he does and I do. So, the boot in exactly like he did, but we're going to partition the drive later on with um, the Linux Live environment, Linux Mint 13. So, all we're actually needing to do, I'm just going to talk through while this boots is um, do exactly the same thing as he does, except we're going to have a limited size to our uh, Windows 98 install, whereas he uses the whole disk, so I'll be back. Basically, you're just watching things boot at the moment. So this will take quite a while on the T42, especially with only one gig of RAM, so I'll be back when there's a relevant section. There we go, so this is what we're looking for. Contents of CD, I don't know if you can see that. Contents of CD are now on drive B. That's where we want to be. Just line this up so it doesn't fall over. Press enter. We'll boot from CD ROM. Start computer without CD ROM support. And then we're going to run F disk. Uh, enable large disk support, yes. All NTFS uh, should NTFS partitions be treated as large? Yes. So, what we want to do now, so I'm going to do some little bits. So, I already had something on here. So, I'm going to delete. Um, so, option three. Delete non DOS partition. So I'm going to delete one. And so this is if you've already got something on the hard drive. And you do that again. Delete. For this, I didn't want to use any of the person who owned this as space. Oh, delete partition. Delete non DOS partition. Delete. Primary partition? No. What am I doing? Um, hmm. Delete. Logical drives. Let's try that. No logical drives. Okay. There we go. So that's set to active. So we want to. Delete partition or logical DOS drive. Let's try that one more time. Standard DOS partition? No. Nope. Okay, I'll be back in a second. There we go. Sorry, it was delete non DOS partition. And then enter. And yes. So that's wiped out everything that was on the drive. So, first thing we need to do is 
create DOS partition. So option one, create primary DOS partition. And let's run some integrity checks. I'm thinking Windows 98 can be installed on as little as 250 megabytes. So I might give it. Hmm, what should I do? What should I do? I'm, I've got time to think it over. Probably need 15 gig for Windows XP at the minimum. I know that that's worked before. For me, hmm, 15, 15 is 30, which leaves 5 and 5. So we'll make this a 5 gig partition. So I'll be back when the drag drive integrity has been completed. Okay, so this is the bit that differs. It's saying, do you want to use the maximum available size for primary DOS, DOS position and make the partition active? You want to click no there. And then it's going to do a run another disk integrity check. As you can see down here, verifying drive integrity, sorry. And we're actually, it asks you to specify, when you say no there, what size you want your disk to be. I think, so the hard drive that's in there is 40 gig. So I'm thinking... If you have 15 gigs each for Windows 7 and XP or something around that sort of figure, but we can sort that out when we get to the Linux Live bit in a bit. That leaves, say, 6 gig for our shared files and uh, 4 gig for Windows 98. So that's what I'm kind of planning on doing. So we'll be back once this integrity check is finished. So after some more brief Google foo, we nearly completed the integrity check. Um, I decided that I'm going to give 4 gigs for Windows 98, 6 gigs for the swap space, um, 10 gigs for Windows XP, leaving 6, sorry, 6 gig for Windows XP, leaving 14 gig for, or something like that. Well, I'll write it all down anyway. But here, you basically what you're doing, you're looking at typing in the partition size you want in thousand because it's in megabytes so we want four thousand megabytes and then i'm going to click enter that is that is basically what we want so we're done there i'm going to set active partition make partition active um one one partition made active and then just to confirm we've done everything right, display partition information, we've got a 4 gig partition for Windows 98, and you press escape, escape, to get back to F disk, um, and then we're going to reboot the system, so I'll be back. So just, just quickly actually, you know, reboot the system, control, alt, delete, should reboot, there we go. Then we're going to go back when it boots off the USB again, because we set that up as the first bootable device. We go back and do exactly the same thing again, basically. So you boot from the tiny ISO. And then the rest of it is basically as you would do in the Phil's Computer Lab video, but I'll show you anyway. So I'll be back once easy to boot as loaded in. So what we've done, we've booted back into the USB and the tiny ISO and gone through all of it, let it load, and then we've typed B colon CD Win98. This takes us into the Windows 98 directory. Format C colon. Proceed with format yes, and it's formatting all four gigs. <coughs> Now, depending on how much space I think I actually need, I'm probably what I'm going to do, similar to what Phil does, again, is put a copy of Windows 98 into a folder on the C drive so that you can get all your drivers for it from there for the basic install. We'll be back when this is uh, finished formatting. So we're back and the formatting is complete. I don't know if you can see that. I'm so sorry. I know I always film off the screen, but with my capture card just can't process the lo this lower resolution. Um, and it says, calculating free space, volume label, enter for none. So I'm thinking I'm going to call it T42. 
There we go, job's good. One second. So we're doing the same thing that uh, Mr. Phil at this computer lab does. So we go to C, which is our new hard drive. We do make directory when set up. Oh. Set up, enter. Go into the directory, so CD win set up. Um, and then go back to B, Oop, B. And Windows 98 folder, copy everything. So asterisk, full stop, asterisk to C. Run that, and this is exactly the same as you did in this video. You could very easily watch it. I'm just going through it in case there's anything that I miss. One second. As you can see from the frequent stops, I'm literally following along with Phil's computer lab to make sure I don't get this wrong. So we're going to go into there, and so we basically type C colon, which takes us back to the C drive, and then just type setup, and then enter. And from here, it's just a standard Windows 98 install. Excuse me, exactly the same as you would do with Phil's computer lab. So I'm not going to show you that. I'm going to get back to you when we're in Windows 98. The next stage is to pull up and open the program called Rufus. Insert your USB stick that you were booting easy to boot off, or a separate one if you're that if you're that way inclined. And then go to your downloads folder where you've got. Linux Mint Cinnamon 13, open, all the basic settings just as it is should be fine, click start, and click OK here, and OK, and OK, and what we're probably going to do is remake the easy to boot USB again, <clears throat> in my case because I've only got one spare USB drive. So while that's doing that, I can show you that we have now got a very, very basic install of Windows 98. I've just cleared up some desktop icons and junk, put the custom logo there. But that's all we've really got. Um, where is it? My computer properties. And you, know, you can see we've got one gig of RAM. Second edition device manager is riddled with things that don't work. So, while that's doing that, you should have, if you were following Phil's computer lab, you should have in a folder in my computer under C, under Win Setup, you should have a folder called Null33E. And you need to run that, restart. Look at that glorious Windows 98 screen. And this was allow us this will allow us to put USB devices and upgrade all the graphics drivers and everything via USB, so that's why we need to do that. It's just loading configuration files, etc. And we should see We can now plug in a USB. We might need to run 6.3 as well. Let's do this. So there's this other file, nusb 36e So we'll run that as well, just in case. Make sure you've got no flash drives in your system before you do that as well, because it'll wipe them. There we go. And then in theory, we should be able to plug this in here now. And the group of drivers that I suggested earlier in the video to download from the website hmm, HAA Soft or something like that. H Soft. I'll add it in the screen. In theory, we should now have access to a removable disk. There we go. So this is the folder I suggested you download, and the. First thing for the graphics drivers, you open the graphics drivers file, 
Actually, let's get this on a tripod. Open the graphic drivers file. And then you sort of, that will attach the files to a place on your C drive. So you install. Now this will fail initially. Oh, that means our Rufus Linux Live CD is ready. So we'll use that in a minute. Got my Linux Live USB there for doing the formatting, and then it should it should say this. This is the aim, and then you go back to your C drive, and you'll find there's a new folder here somewhere called ATI and support, and that one, and then you go down to um, what do you do again? Ah, uh, yeah, you find this driver folder here, and then that one. So this folder is what you're looking for. So you go to My Computer, Properties, Device Manager, Display Adapter, right-click, Properties, Driver, Update Driver, specify the location of the driver, display a list of drivers in a specific location so you can select the driver you want have disk just waiting for that to do its thing and browse well, you can't switch that so browse and it'll tell you that you can't access the A drive but then it'll move on to something else just be patient just be patient. There, so we, then we go to that folder we just looked at before, which is under C, ATI, support, WME, driver, 98, inf, and then you, the one I used was C9, you can see that, the last one on the list, basically. Click OK, OK. And then this list, you want to go down and find your graphics driver. So that would be in, where is it? There we go. It's Radeon, the very bottom one, Radeon 7500 series. Install, yes. Next. May have to faff around, but in theory that just worked. Restart now. I need to quickly unplug this USB stick because I forgot to remove it before it boots back in, so when you see the splash screen, unplug. Windows 98, 96, 95, 94, 93, 92, 91. We're just gonna install the graphics drivers for now, and then we're gonna do all the rest post Windows XP. I just wanted to get the nice screen resolution available. So I think so now we should have, there we go. And we can go up to ridiculous undisplayable pixel level, but we want 124 by 768. Apply. Yes, and it looks a bit nicer. And we want true color 32 bit. Apply. Apply new color setting without restarting. So, there we have one roughly installed version of Windows 98. So then we shut down the system, and we'll come back and install all the drivers in a bit. So we shut down the system, take our Linux Live USB, which you can just about make out here, the chrome thing in my hand, I've not got enough light, plug that in, and in fact, actually my light should be charged by now. At least for a brief period. There we go, we got some light on the situation. Shed some delicious, delicious light on the situation. There we go, and then boot again. It should boot into the Linux live environment automatically, or you can set it to do that at your behest. It's entirely up to you. I'm in trouble with my uh, 
tripod. Just kind of graft it together with tape. Right, let's see. Is that a good fit? Yeah, that's, that looks all right. Should we put that more in the light as well? I'm just chatting away, you know, doing my thing. Got a text message, so I'll be back when the live environment is booted. So, as you may realize, we are now in the Linux environment, so you right click the desktop, because you don't get any start menu or anything. I don't quite know the eye that was, but this flummoxed me for ages. And there's sudo uh, gparted, I think it is. This. And then it opens this bad boy up here. Let's see, can you see that well enough? I can draw in a little bit closer. Come closer, my child. Let's see, how can we do this? So, so here you can see we've got our FAT32 and we've got Anna. So that's our, that is, the FAT32 partition is Windows 98. So we need to divide this one up. So new, right click on allocated, then new. And then you want to, we want that to be a swap file. So we're going to go down to, well, not a swap file, sorry, a uh, swap partition of about 6 gig. So it's totally 10 gig. You see where it says new size? There we go. So there's new size there. And then we go to that, and we want it to be NTFS under file system. Primary partition, label, win, capital X, capital P. Actually, let's put a capital W on the start, that'd be classy. Win XP. So that's our Windows. Oh no, hold on. I've done that wrong. So, sorry, I got confused. We actually want to title this shared files. That was all, that was all the mistake I made. Shard, shared files and this is so you can transfer things between Windows 98 and that actually I need to format to FAT32 and this next one we're going to new again I wish I had a better way of filming this um, next one is going to be uh, ooh, what do we want we want about 16 gigs for Windows 7. So if we do take that down to 8 gig, we'll call that win XP, make that fat th uh, NTFS, and then add. And then the remaining unallocated space, create a new one with the remainder of the space, call it win. Seven, and then that's also NTFS, and then add. So in theory, unless I'm mistaken, I hope you saw all of that. But what we'll just go through it again just to make sure. So we've made a second FAT32 partition, which I need to label um, information. Okay. Well, I'll relabel that in a minute. Um, so that is FAT32, and that's going to be the shared files. Then we've got NTFS 7.8 gig for Windows XP, and 19 gigs for Windows 7. So that's like just rough, 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 rough. And then we go up to, to uh, edit and apply all operations. And apply. And at this stage, it doesn't dramatically matter if we got it wrong because we've only got to do what we've done before again. So it's, that's why I didn't install all the drivers fully for Windows 98, just in case this process destroys them, the uh, install. And then, so that's worked. And then we need to just relabel this second FAT32 partition in a minute. It's good. Oh, we've got 1.9 megabyte. Free? What's that about? Fat32. Label. We'll call that shared. Shared. Uh, 
add files then 1.9 megabyte that, that's fine we can leave that actually no we need to we need to integrate that uh, resize so we want to go up and utilize that there we go I will leave that. Refresh. So we've got there we go. We're good to go. And then quit. Two penny uh two penny operations. Edit apply all operations. Boom. Just increasing that little bit that was left over. I do hope this is clear what I'm doing. We're leaving four partitions in particular. It seems to think that it's got four hours remaining, so I might cancel that. Uh, continue operation. Right, I'll be back once this is done. Right, that ends up taking about 10 minutes, and it felt like an infinity of internal torture. But it resized it, and it's all the correct size. Everything's all groovy as far as I'm aware. I'm just waiting for this to. There we go. So we've got everything at the sizes we want. We've got the T42 uh, Windows 98 install. We've got a shared folder or shared files. We've got Windows XP blank NTF NTFS and Windows 7 blank NTFS. So we're going to quit. And then if you press and hold the power button, because there isn't any option to do it any other way, it'll bring up this thing and then you go shut down then after we've done this we prepare an easy to boot USB again on our other computer and return and install Windows XP first so let's do that next just a little note if you click you need to reformat so basically delete the partition Linux Mint off the USB stick before you recreate the okay a new part it's a new volume uh -huh. before you can create another easy to boot USB with Windows XP on it. There you go, that's done. Refresh this, make easy to boot, okay. And this again, I will link another video for this. And this is, I'll show you the, again, show you the difference. But other than this, it's exactly what will be in the video again from Phil's Computer Lab because this video is going to be long enough as it is without me actually meticulously showing you how to do it. We've made the now on the original flash drive that has previously had Windows 98, then Linux. Now we've got Windows XP. Now I'm not going to show you the whole installation process, I'll just link the video. But I will again show you how to. Oh, just because it's incredibly long winded, and there's a video that shows you exactly how to do it. And I'll show you the bit that is different from uh, the video that I link. Again, from Phil's Computer Lab. I keep saying his name over and over again. Over and over again. It's because he's good. I will be back when we get to the bit that is different. So, yeah, I always say so at the start of everything, it's quite funny. Let's get some light on this situation as well. There we go. So, as I always say, we're at the bit now where we need to figure it out. So we just basically, the only difference from the normal one from the video I put in the description is you go down to your Windows XP partition, <coughs> which I've got as F because it's the third partition. You click enter, and then you format using NTFS file system quick. Format, press F. <coughs> and other than that, just follow the video that... That's the only difference, but if you follow that video that is linked in the description about how to install from USB, then you'll be hunky-dory, and I'll go along with the driver installations as well in a minute. So that's when you'll see me next. Right, so to get to Windows XP, you have to pull out the USB stick, where you would normally just boot straight into it, 
from when from step two of Phil's video. Uh, with this computer, you have to remove the USB stick, let it boot, and then put the USB stick back in before it gets to the Windows screen here for it to actually work. So it's just a little bit of a finicky thing <coughs> that is required. And then from there on, it's it's pretty much just a straightforward Windows XP install, as far as I'm aware. You just do everything you would do. So I, again, I said I was going to be back early for drivers. But this time I actually will be back when driver install takes place because I just remembered that that was a bit of a finicky thing with this laptop for some reason. I'll be back. So we're going to Windows XP now. Um, and there's a little tr thing you have to do because with Phil's um, easy to boot installation, I, you just boot straight in from the second step. And then that takes you directly in. Whereas with this laptop, for some reason, that requires. Hold on. Right. Well, that's exactly what I was talking about. So, I need to reboot the system. So, power off the system. Hold on. So, once you've got your Windows XP installed, let's just shed some light in this situation. There we go. Nice and bright. Got your basic Windows XP installed, so we just, we just this is literally the first boot after everything's installed. It should prompt you to ask if you want to remove something called Fire Disk. So please ensure to click yes. So you go to the dialog box up here, type yes, enter, and then eject the USB. So that's my storage device. Stop. Okay. All good. And then this is more or less done with. Until we get round to Windows 7. And we've got our USB stick here. So the first thing I'm going to do is put the Zoom uh, theme on it because I really like Zoom. And then I'm going to copy over my little, uh, where is it? Hmm, not recognizing my USB stick. Maybe it's a bit loose. Uh, we'll give it a minute. But yeah, we're going to get the correct resolution. That's the first thing. Properties, setting 1024 by 768. And we have and this accepts a beautiful basic install of Windows XP. So, it's not recognizing this, and that's a problem for me, because I was about to use it to install Snappy Driver. To install the drivers using Snappy Driver. I don't know why it's not working. So I'll come back in a sec. I just gave it a, I just gave it a quick reboot. And I'm going to show you, so you've got Windows, Microsoft Windows, that's 98, and then the XP Professional is um, XP, obviously. And I think I just needed to give it a quick reboot, because it was using this USB stick that was in there before as kind of a boot disk. <coughs> so hopefully this USB will work. It is USB 3.0, but I didn't have this problem before, so I'm assuming that it will be fine once we boot back into Windows. Obviously there's no audio, there's no there's no drivers at all installed at the moment, so if we can't get this USB stick to work, I'll be very disappointed. But I will present you with the solution, should it fail. Right. There we go. I don't want the tour of Windows XP, as glorious as it is. I'm going to remove this from the list. There we go. My computer. Untitled, there we go. So here's all my nonsense I've got for it. The main thing we're after, so the two things I've got on here that we're interested in for this one is this one here called, I don't know whether you'll be able to see that, let me make it a bit bigger. It's called USP4, so it's 
service pack for, but first we're using Snappy Driver. We're going to go to the one that's recognised, not the 64 bit one. Let's get a bit more light here, Let's see if that's any better. No, that's significantly worse. We want to unblock, create restore point, select all, but the ATI Radeon ones, you actually want to untick that and go down to the second one. Other than that, you just click install, and it's done, Bob's your uncle. So I'll be back when that's done to install unofficial service pack four, and then we'll move on to unofficial service pack three for Windows 98 and install the drivers there. And then we're gonna do a nice, flavoursome and tasteful install of Windows 7. As you can see, or maybe not, but as far as I can tell, that is everything installed. So what we need to do is close Snappy Driver. Oh no, hold on. Scratch that. There's something else being installed that I wasn't aware of. Uh, hide installed drivers. Huh. Sorry, I must be mistaken. Snappy driver for there we go right. Last thing I want to do shit quickly before I restart is copy this to our shared file drive so that I can put it on all the desktops of all the different operating systems. So set as desktop background, close, close, and then you should hear the most delightful sound in the history of computing in just one moment. So let's eject this use B stick. Ejected and here we go, here we go, here we go, here we go. My favourite sound in the world is coming up shortly after this. There's one of the greatest sounds in history. <coughs> we all know what you want. We know what you want. You wanna hear that startup chime, don't you? You wanna hear it. But you can wait. Come this far through the video. So after this, we're going to basically install. Oh, there we go. Windows XP boot in, and we should have one fully functional, all drivered up with the correct desktop background. So we basically got XP to where we wanted it. Excuse me for burping. So. That is literally everything working now, except for unofficial service pack four, three, sorry, no, four, unofficial service pack four. Homina. So I'm gonna quickly go to my USB stick on my computer, that's what I'm titled, and it's called this this file here. I'm gonna install that cheeky, 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 cheeky. Don't want the tour to come up. That's a bit annoying that it keeps coming up. I also have an antivirus, an offline antivirus that I'm going to install in a minute. But I'm going to go through and do all that kind of like housekeeping shit once we've got Service Pack 4 installed. So I'm just going to talk you through that briefly. Is my camera working? I can't tell. Yeah, it is. That's great. That's great. Can you see that? It's just extracting the files. <clears throat> oh, we can put some light into the situation as well. Ooh, sexy red lights. Rocks! Oh, well, you can watch that while I sort my torch out. There we go. Might speed up that bit of the video. Note to self, speed up that section of the video. Uh, I'll be back once this is done. Here we go. Quickly, while that's doing that, we can be, whilst it's installing it, we can go to our uh, USB with all our files on it. Copy the folder. That's some video files. It's not as long. IBM ThinkPad drives, this folder here. We can copy that. 
also to our shared file if we've got enough space which we should have there's only driver files and then we can just access that directly from windows 98 in case there's any issues uh, what else have we got just because I'm doing this now because it might mess up and yeah I've got my games here from GOG they can be copied there as well if there's enough space right so whilst that's doing that we can go to install Windows Service Pack 4 I hope you can see this clearly the camera sorry if it makes an annoying sound you have to agree to the terms and conditions and basically this is just like uh, I chose to do not archive files because um, I'm not going to re remove it and then you just next basically what this does is it gives you all the feature updates that you would have got from Windows anyway right up until 2014 when Windows XP was retired so it's enormously handy and I'll be back when that's done and all my files are copied just to save you any more arduous watching of installing so we're going to take our other USB stick and we're going to go to downloads and we're going to so you need to install image burn basically IMG burn which I've already got installed but you go to the file where you downloaded it and install it cancel and what we're going to do is you basically take create image file from disk there you would in this part here you would put you'd have your DVD of Windows 7 then you choose a destination file as you can see I've already got it there and then you just press this button which will be available and that's how you rip your ISO for Windows 7 but now what we need to do once we've done that is open Rufus up once more with our USB stick in select the ISO we've just ripped from our Windows 7 disk and add that to our my Chrome USB aka the one that we're using to install operating systems so we've got service pack 4 installing there we've got Windows 7 32-bit ultimate copying there and this here is me editing the video so I'm a multitasking resourceful kind of guy so I'll be back for the Windows 7 install and to show you the completion of service pack 4 and then after we've done that if I know before we've done that we're gonna go and install um, unofficial service pack no nah, no nah, no nah. we're gonna install Windows 7 first in case it boils or everything and then we're gonna go back and install the official service pack then we're gonna put the RAM back in and then we're basically done so we just installed uh, unofficial service pack 4 on Windows XP I want to turn off the old computer. We're going to restart the computer just to make sure it works and hasn't destroyed anything. And we've got our. Oh, yeah, that's such a good sound. We've got our Windows 7 uh, install USB as well. Should be relatively straightforward to install, so I'll be back. I'll just do, I'll do some basic admin, <laughs> confirm that it's working, and then I'll get back with the Windows 7 install. So I transferred via the USB to the shared files folder all the drivers. I've just been through meticulously installing them. Uh, un unofficial service pack 4 went through for Windows XP, so I'm just going to install Windows 98 service pack 3 beta. Now uh, this is a license agreement. I'm close this folder. And basically you just got to wait for that to install and I should be back when it's done to show you the differences. So I've got all the components, it brings up a list of quite a few run sites and I've just selected them all just for shits and giggles. Here we go. go install and very shortly we'll have unofficial service pack 3 for Windows 98. So installation is now complete, we're just going to complete the installation and restart. So we booted into our Windows 7 USB, we've got our partition we made in the Linux Live CD with 19.5 gigs. 
it appears to be allowing us to install all nice and nicely and from here it's just literally a standard Windows 7 installation so I'll show you when I've installed Snappy Driver, use Snappy Driver again for Windows 7 because it has all the files um, but from here there's basically just drivers to install so I'm going to do all that and then we'll basically be back where we started so what have we done, we've installed all the Windows 7 drivers we've installed we re, re put in the two gigs of RAM again. Um, I've activated Windows. And the only thing I haven't really done is signed into the internet because my internet's been cut off, which is going to be really inconvenient. Well, yeah, basically, let me just put that away. Activated Windows, open Device Manager. have a fully whistle oh no maybe not this is a good time to show you snappy driver on so I installed the wrong graphics drivers basically what I did before was properties and then roll back the driver to VGA which was annoying but it worked and then update driver software in automatic search. Okay, cool. Then we open Snappy Driver 32 bit. Might have to reboot before I do this. Oh, yeah, I've got a reboot, so I'll be back in a jiffy with the video drivers installed and then I'm going to switch back to the MSATA SSD because basically the process is complete I've done everything I intended to do and then we're going to benchmark it with the SSD um, might do some tests of read and write speeds but probably not because it's like 5am and I'm exhausted we're going to benchmark some games so I'll be back so at this stage, the, the video has gone on way too long and become way too complex. As you can see here, uh, I'm installing all the Windows 7 updates. And I've, because I did, basically I did the Windows 98 uh, Service Pack 3 and Windows XP Service Pack 4, but now I'm updating Windows 7. So I'm not going to make you sit and watch all of that. I'm sure you can figure out how to update Windows 7. Um, but I'm, so I'm going to do a separate video, basically, with this device. Also, I discovered that the language on here is Thai. So that's actually quite fascinating. So I might even install the language pack in this, the font pack and just type in Thai for the laws. Um, but yeah, I'll be back with another more condensed review and gameplay footage and um, kind of benchmarks of the SSD versus the hard drive and stuff. So thanks for watching. I've been Tech Dave and this has been the T42 Triple Boot Update Video.